So they end up in a forward position, and, and as this attack goes, they end up now having to switch from attacking to a defensive position, and things start to get go sideways really, really quick. And this ends up, it, this is actually the beginning of the Battle of the Bulge. It's a famous, obviously a famous battle, and this is sort of the beginning of it, although they did not know that at this time. So here we go back to the book. I took stock of our defensive situation. We were one rifle battalion thrust into a densely wooded area with no terrain features that favored the defender with orders to hold at all costs. We were hastily dug in along a highway facing the direction from which we hoped the enemy would come if he had to come. No company had been able to withhold a support platoon. There was no support company. Thus, the defense was a thin, single line of riflemen. So there's no backup. That's the situation they're in. A shallow draw lay to the front of my rifle platoons with a higher ridge rising beyond it over which the enemy would soon be coming. Another draw led up to my left flank protected by two light machine guns and a few riflemen in position which no man in his right mind would place machine guns unless he had no other method of defending the probable enemy approach. These guys are in a horrible situation. Our right flank lacked... our right flank lacked 50 yards of tying in with K Company along a fire break which bisected the highway. We had no anti-tank defense except two Sherman tanks and a bazooka with three rounds of ammunition. We were being supported by 99th Division Artillery, an outfit about which we knew nothing except this was their first action except for holding a quiet defensive sector for a month. But there was nothing that could be done now but wait. At 10.30, a jeep loaded with men clipped down the highway toward the rear at breakneck speed. That would be the vanguard of the retreating battalion from the 99th. The Germans would be here soon. Just imagine that. You're there to help out and defend this position and support this battalion. And the first thing you see coming from ahead of you is a jeep filled with ragtag soldiers going as fast as they can away from the enemy. Craziness. Craziness. And here it continues. A ragged column of troops appeared over the wooded ridge to the front of the second and third platoons. There were not over 200 men the remnants of 900 who had fought gallantly to our front since they were hit by the German attack the preceding day. Another group the size of a platoon withdrew along the highway, donating a few hand grenades and clips of ammunition, which they passed to my first platoon. Two men stayed to fight with my company. It's legit. You just got overrun. Some guys are giving away ammunition, giving grenades away, and these guys are, hey, where can I help out? Two enlisted men carrying a badly wounded lieutenant stopped exhausted with my third platoon. They could carry him no further. I called for a litter squad. The riflemen could not be sure if the next troops that appeared over the ridge were friendly or enemy. I alerted the artillerymen to call for fire in the event the approaching troops were German. Lieutenant Brock's call came a few minutes later, scarcely preceding a hail of small arms fire, which sounded like the crack of thousands of rifles echoing through the forest. There was no doubt now. My men could see the build caps of the approaching troops. They were Germans. And, you know, we're going to get to a point as I go through these books and I highlight little sections and I read that little section. I'm about to get to a point here shortly where I'm just going to read the whole damn section because it's, it's so much. It's a company that's about to get overrun. Right, it's a company that's about to get overrun by Germans, and it's it's really interesting to hear what this looks like from the company commander, company commander's perspective. But this is, I mean, this is it. This is you're losing the battle. I mean, he survives, but it's it's as bad as it gets. Mm. It's as bad as it gets. Back to the book. Enemy bullets whistled through the trees around us. I jumped into the slit trench with Savage and Blackburn. Requests. After requests for artillery and mortar support came from the platoon leaders. I called for every concentration listed on my overlay and for variations of each. So that little thing I was talking about where you're calling for these concentrations, you got two, two, three, and this one, and that one. He's just calling for all of them. Calling for all of them. Just bomb everything. The inevitable maddening three rounds fell each time. So they're trying to conserve, in the rear, they're trying to conserve op- um, conserve ammunition. So they're only firing three rounds at a time. And he's, do it again, do it again, do it again. Mm-hmm. The platoon leaders begged frantically for more. I began on one side of the company 
area and called for concentrations all across our front and back again. Lieutenant Sawyer called for barrage after barrage of 81 millimeter mortar fire. The crack of small arms reached an ear splitting crescendo, crescendo like static on a forgotten radio during an electric storm. I lay flat on my back in the slit trench, the platoon phone to one ear, the receiver of the battalion radio on the other. The chill from the frozen earth seeped through my clothes and I shivered, but I was surprised at my own calmness. The long nights of shaking terror in the pillboxes convinced me that I would never be calm in combat. I did not know what had possessed me to keep calm. Surely, this is the most serious situation in which I had ever found myself. The small arms fire reached another crackling crescendo. Crescendo. The small arms fire reached another crackling crescendo. Long had several men wounded. Long as one of the other commanders. He didn't know how many or how badly. The enemy bullets were too thick to move around. Were too thick to move around. I called again for litter squads. Wave after wave of frantically screaming German infantry stormed the slight tree-covered rise held by three platoons. A continuous hail of fire exuded from their weapons, answered by volley after volley from the defenders. Germans fell left and right. A few rounds of artillery The few rounds of artillery we did succeed in bringing down caught the attackers in a draw to our front, and we could hear their screams of pain when the small arms fire would slacken. But still they came. Artillery and Nebelwerfers, which is like another kind of cannon, a German cannon, with their accompanying terrifying screams played a deep accompaniment in the background. The shells exploded to our rear and around the road junction to our right. We ignored their crushing explosions, thinking how thankful we were that their effects were reserved for others than ourselves. The small arms fire rose and fell again and then again, indicating that the attacking troops had withdrawn momentarily to the bottom of the draw to regroup before launching another suicidal assault. Reinforcements streamed over the ridge behind them to join the assaults. The draw and the highway were littered with their dead and wounded, but there seemed to be no end of their fanatical attacks. Second platoon reported a company soldier killed. It was the first, first death in company I since I had taken command three months before, but the news was not so staggering as I had expected it would be. There was too much other excitement. The dead soldier was... Technician 5th grade Martin W. Carlson from Pennsylvania. He was an aid man whom the rifleman idolized, who had jumped from his foxhole to aid a wounded soldier nearby. A bullet pierced his helmet, and he fell face forward into a hole of the wounded rifleman he had sought to aid. He was a non-combatant, according to the rules of warfare, and was denied the privilege of wearing the combat infantryman badge and the $10 per month pittance for dangers and hardship endured, but death made no distinction. Message after message came over the platoon phone. Lieutenant Wilson was badly wounded. He could not walk and must have a litter. Ammunition was running lower and lower. The M Company machine gunners with the first platoon were out of ammunition except enough to keep one gun firing a few minutes longer. The 60mm mortars found their ammunition supply so low that they fired only when the enemy was actually assaulting. Germans were being killed as close as 10 yards forward of the foxholes. Hand grenades were practically all gone. Yeah, this is, this is it. There was no solace from the battalion. Each call for litter bearers or additional ammunition was met with the maddening words, we're doing all we can. I told them we could not hold out much longer unless we got additional ammunition. Captain Montgomery said, we must hold. Our orders are to hold at all costs, he said. I wondered if he could possibly realize the meaning of those words. We must hold until every last man was killed or captured. Company eyes last stand. And what is to be gained? Nothing but time. Time born of the bodies of dead men. Time. Seven times the enemy infantry assaulted, and seven times they were greeted by a hail of small arms fire and hand grenades that sent them reeling down the hill, leaving behind a growing pile of dead and wounded. But with all, the the attacks seemed poorly organized. There was no supporting artillery or mortar fire on our positions, and I wondered why they had not yet found the open flank on our left. 
There was only the suicidal wave of fanatical infantrymen whooping and yelling and brandishing their rifles like men possessed. I looked at my watch. It was 3.30 in the afternoon. Time was passing amazingly fast. Long, again Long was the uh, was one of the other platoon commanders. Long said he saw enemy tanks. There were five of them. Giant tigers lumbering down the road 300 yards away, surrounded by over 100 in- enemy infantrymen. Get those Shermans into action. Sherman was our, our U.S. tank. Get those Shermans into action. It's your only hope. You might He's talking to himself. You might hold off the infantry, even with your ammunition practically exhausted, but riflemen can't fight Tiger tanks. The first platoon has your only three rounds of bazooka ammo. Unless the Shermans can stop them, three rockets are all there is between you and Company I and Kingdom Come. So... Small arms, obviously, machine guns, they don't do anything to a tank. And they only have, and there's five enemy tanks coming, and they only have three bazooka rounds, which a bazooka round can stop a tank. But, you know, you got to hit. It's got to be a good hit and all that. So he knows he's in big, big trouble. I called Sergeant Garcia to send a man to contact the tankers and tell them to move immediately to their former positions on the left flank. This business of improved positions was so much bosh. Garcia's answer was stunning. They're gone, Captain. They pulled back to K Company 15 minutes ago. <laughs> so he's expecting the Sherman tanks there to be help out? They're gone. I did not take time for the full meaning of his words to sink in. Giving our, giving our call sign over the radio, I asked Colonel Tuttle and told him my plight. Either I get those tanks back to my left flank or I could not possibly hold the position. While waiting for the Colonel's answer, I tried barrage after barrage to destroy the Tigers with artillery and mortars, but we made not a single hit, and the near misses only stopped the infantry temporarily, not phasing the great steel monsters in the least. They waddled effortlessly on toward the hapless riflemen. A round of 88 millimeters snapped from the top snapped the top from a fir tree above our heads and fragments sprayed down in all directions. There could be no doubt now, the Tigers had arrived. Round after round crashed into the area. A momentary shrill whistle followed by a deafening explosion and a sharp thud of the round being fired, the latter reaching us after we heard the shell explode. For God's sake, Captain, Long screamed over the phone, his half-voice sobbing. Get those tanks down here. Do something. For God's sake, these bastards are sitting 75 yards away and pumping 88s into our foxholes like we're sitting ducks. For God's sakes, Captain. What about your bazooka? He said a bullet had gone in one end and bent the tube so the rocket would not pass through. Colonel Tuttle was on the battalion radio. The tankers said it would be suicide for them to face the Tiger tanks. They would not move unless he gave them a direct order and then he was afraid they would disobey it. And he was inclined to agree that they stood no chance against the more heavily armored Tigers and the 88s. So these American tanks, are, they can't fight against the Tigers and so they're backing up so that they can survive. I burned with anger, and I must have been insubordinate. If my men could fight the armor-plated monsters with nothing but rifles and die in the attempt, the tankers could afford to try it with medium tanks. If we don't get the tanks, we can't hold another five minutes, I said slowly and finally. Thank you, sir. Roger, out. And for those of you that don't know, I've explained this before. Out means you don't need to talk back to me. You don't need to. I'm not requesting a response. Out means I'm done. I'm hanging up the radio, which is interesting that normally the the junior person the 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 says you know over, and it's the senior person that says, "Hey, don't talk to me anymore." Right? Mm -hmm. I'm done with you. So he's saying to the to his leader, he's saying, "If we don't get the tanks, we can't hold another five minutes." Thank you, sir. Roger. Out. Shades of General Custer company eyes last stand hell what does it matter you never expected to get out of this war alive anyway not really I gave long the news he was frantic there was absolutely nothing he and his men could do a direct hit had landed on one of the heavy machine guns another had hit the technical hit technical sergeant Smith's foxhole Smith was the platoon sergeant long didn't know if he was dead or not the other machine gun crew was out of ammunition and was withdrawing He was powerless to stop them. He was afraid his left flank and the draw was falling back, but he couldn't see to make sure. Hold, Long, I cried. For God's sakes, hold. We've got to hold. I wondered how 
I made my voice so convincing. I wanted to throw away the platoon phone and the battalion radio and everything connected with the war and bury my head in my hands and cry, cry, cry. The infantry assault upon the other platoons continued. The sound of the battle reached a height which I had never thought possible before. The burst of the 88 millimeter shells in the woods vied with the sound of hundreds of lesser weapons. It couldn't last forever, I thought. It must stop sometime. It must stop, but when and how? I looked toward the draw between me and the highway. About 20 men were walking down the draw toward the rear. I recognized several men from the light machine gun section and a machine gun crew from M Company. The others were riflemen from 1st Platoon. I did not know where they were going. All I knew is that somehow I must stop them. I jumped from the slit trench and ran toward them, ignoring the crack of bullets through the trees, waving my arms and shouting for them to stop. They turned to look at me with vague, blank expressions. They seemed to wonder who was this crazy man who wanted them to do this foolish thing. I saw that it was the entire left flank of 1st Platoon. The thin lines of the remainder of the platoons would soon be cut off from the rear. The 60 millimeter mortar men a few yards away, a few yards away, were dismantling their weapons. I managed to get my mo- to get the men to move to my CP, but I could not step them th- stop them there. They walked slowly on towards the rear, half dazed expressions on their faces. So his guys are leaving, and he's doing what he can to get them to stop and fight. But they're they're leaving. This is it's not happening. The guys know, and and they're out. I mean, they're out of bullets, <laughs> right? They're out of bullets. They don't have any ammunition left. Yeah. There's nothing to do. Yeah. So they're leaving. I jumped into the slim, slit trench and grasped the radio handpiece. I sat on the edge of the trench, ignoring the whistle of bullets and the crash of 88 millimeter shells around us as everyone seemed to be now doing. Get the platoon leaders on the phone, I called the savage. Hello, Roger One, I said into the radio, not waiting for my acknowledgement that they were receiving my message. This is Mac. My left flank has fallen back. I can't stop them. The Germans are overrunning my left platoon. I'll try to build up another line along the fire break. We can't hold here. There, I had said it. This was I Company turning tail and running. This was I Company retreating. This was I Company hauling ass. This was I Company running like a son of a bitch. Strangely, I didn't give a damn. I was utterly void of feeling. Savage held the platoon phone toward me. I can't get long, he said, and Scotty's here with us now. Don't sound afraid. You've got to sound like you mean business. Hello, Brock, I said calmly. They've overrun Long's position. Swing your platoon back to the left rear, and we'll build up another line along the fire break. Did you get that, Garcia? Pull back, and we'll tie with K Company. My CP's pulling out now. We've got to hold at the fire break. Do you understand that? We've got to hold the fire break. The men in my CP group were already moving towards the rear. I grabbed my mus- my Musette bag and my carbine. Savage took the phone. Blackburn grabbed the radio. We ran toward the rear. We reached the north-south fire break and crossed it. The foxholes which battalion had o- occupied were fa- along the far end of the clearing in a patch of small firs whose interwoven branches formed a small, dense, green barrier. I knew that any fight here would be at close quarters because the Germans would be able to advance unseen to the edge of the fire break 15 yards from the foxholes we would occupy. But it was the only spot where we had any possibility of holding. I ran up and down the line shouting, we've got to hold him here. We've got to hold him here. The men stared back at me unbelievingly. I was asking headquarters men, armed with carbines and pistols, to hold off hordes of attacking Germans that had already broken through all our rifle platoons could offer. There was only one machine gun, a light gun manned by Private First Class Richard Cowan of Wichita, Kansas, set up five feet from the foxhole which I occupied. The Germans were almost upon us before we knew what was happening. We could not see them for the low-hanging branches of the fir trees across the fire break, but we could hear their shouts and shrill whistle signals, which evidently came from their leaders. I decided they were a flanking group that was on its way unseen around our left flank even as we left our former CP. The attackers who had dislodged 1st Platoon could not have reached us so quickly. 
Cowan began to spit machine gun fire across the nor- narrow fire break, and I heard German I heard a German scream with pain. The headquarters men fired their carbines and pistols into the low hanging branches. The fir trees to the right were too thick to see the area where the rifle platoons were supposed to be going into position. I wondered if they had been able to build up any semblance of a line. A round came from an enemy tank, broke the top of the small fir tree above Cowan's head, sending him reeling from the gun, but he jumped back and continued to fire. I knew that the big tigers had reached the junction, the fire break, and the highway. Hails of enemy bullets thrashed the snow and the fir and the trees around us. The fir trees around us. I ducked beneath the cover of my foxhole trying to get battalion on the radio, but without success. I stood up and looked out of the hole. Great God, there was no one left but Cowan. The others had fallen back. I jumped from the foxhole and yelled to Cowan to withdraw. Savage and Blackburn followed me. I left my musset bag lying on the ground, but my carbine was over my shoulder. Absentmindedly, I screamed to get the radios. Savage jumped back into the foxhole, and Blackburn and I turned and plunged through thickly interlaced branches of the little firs. Bullets followed us, lashing the firs on all sides, and I wondered if maybe I had been hit. I felt no pain, but I could not see how any human being could endure those hails of bullets and not be wounded. I stumbled blindly through the brush, unheedful of the branches scratching at my face and hands. My overshoes were slick, and I tripped and fell face downward in the snow. I rose again and stumbled on blindly. As we plunged through the firs, I was separated from Blackburn and the group that had held briefly at the fire break. I did not worry that Savage or the others were not with me. They were at some place else in the fir thicket. I came across Sergeant Albine and Sergeant Walter L. Dietrich of Cincinnati, Ohio, a machine gun squad leader. We plowed through the firs together until we came unexpectedly upon K's K Company CP. A series of half-completed foxholes dug in the frozen red earth. Captain Howard C. Wilson of Houston, Texas, the K Company commander, was talking frantically over his 300 radio. He turned as I approached. Damn, but I'm glad to see you, he said. Battalion lost contact with you, and I haven't heard anything about how your company's coming. He seemed more relieved than perturbed at seeing me, and I wondered what he thought brought me to his CP. Perhaps it was the way I stood looking at him blankly. There must have been nothing in my face to tell him that my company was no more. And that even now hordes of Germans were rushing toward us unchecked. Through my mind raced only one thought. I had failed and failed miserably. My orders had been to hold at all costs. And I personally had failed. And because of my failure the entire entire battalion would be routed or annihilated and all from a local German counterattack. I company had fallen back, but I could not blame the men. They had given in because I had some way not led them correctly. It was I who was responsible. I would turn in my captain's bars if I ever reached the rear, or perhaps they would court-martial me. I did not care. There's nobody on your left flank, I told Captain Wilson in a matter-of-fact voice that I hardly recognized as my own. They just knocked the hell out of us and the whole company's fallen back. I couldn't tell you where any of I company is right now except these two sergeants and myself. Good God, what can I do, Mac? I don't know, I said. You can't hold here. There's nothing on your left. And then... It continues. My platoon has fallen back, he cried. It's those goddamn tanks. Yeah, I said. I had three rounds of bazooka ammo, and they knocked the bazooka out. I've got six rounds, Six rounds, Captain Wilson said. Two men grabbed a bazooka and disappeared into the underbrush in the direction of the enemy. I thought how foolish it was to think of stopping ten Tiger tanks with one bazooka. The two soldiers returned a moment later, panting for breath. Good God, Captain, one of them said. The woods... Just a few yards away from here are full of the bastards. We better get the hell out. That settles it. Tell your other platoons to withdraw into Creek Elt and Rockershelt. Notify battalion. Tell them we're getting the hell out. We plunged again through the thick fir trees towards the rear. I heard Cap. I heard battalion on Captain Wilson's radio telling L Company to withdraw into Rosherath before the full force of the enemy's flanking drive could hit them. We reached the edge of the patch of small firs. 
to our left lay the exposed highway leading up the hill into Rocherath. To our right, the corner of the fir thicket joined the corner of a patch of larger trees which extended out 200 yards up the hill. We chose the louder route without hesitation. We ran halfway through the patch of woods before we came upon a group of abandoned foxholes. Captain Wilson yelled the group to the halt. We'll hold up here, he shouted. We may be able to hold them up for a while while some of the others get out. I could not see what good we could do from this position, but I was taking commands now, and I took cover alone in a foxhole on the edge of the f- woods facing the highway. It was good to let someone else do the thinking for a while, even if I disagreed with the decision. I was not afraid. Instead, I was strangely apathetic to the whole affair. The Germans were hot on our tails, so what? They'd been hot on my tail for almost as long as I could remember now, and they had cut my company to ribbons. They might as well get me, too. German infantrymen emerged from the thicket we had left such a short time before and milled around two US abandoned U.S. tanks parked in the open beside the forest. A Company M machine gunner, Private First Class Jose M. Lopez of Brownsville, Texas, set up his gun beside a hole five feet to my rear. He opened up on the German infantry with a blast of muzzle, the blast of muzzle forcing me to sink to the bottom of my hole for cover. The Germans wasted no time in returning fire, riddling the area around the machine gun in my foxhole with a burp gun and rifle fire. A Tiger tank appeared at the road junction where the, where the battalion had been shelled the night before and fired point blank at Lopez's exposed position. The long barrel of the 88 on the tank seemed to reach half the distance from the hole to my foxhole. Lopez continued to fire. An American Jeep with two aid men their red Geneva crosses painted on their helmets tore down the highway from the direction of Rosherath toward the road junction. I held my breath. The Tiger tank would surely blast them from the road. Couldn't they see the Germans were here now? They did. With the Jeep spinning on two wheels, they turned around and tore back up the road. The tank did not fire. Over the noise of Lopez's machine gun, I could hear the Captain Wilson shouting to withdraw into Rosherath. I wanted to obey, but I was caught in the crossfire of the heavy machine gun and the attackers. I gritted my teeth and waited for a lull in the firing. None came. I jumped from the hole and ran blindly towards the rear. Bullets snipped at my heels. The tank saw that we were running again and opened with renewed vigor. The big shells snapping the tops from the trees around us as if they were matchsticks, but I saw no one fall. Dusk was approaching, and it was difficult to see for any great distance. I could not make out the town of Rocherath that I knew was high on the hill to our left front, but we plunged blindly up the hill following a thin hedgerow that would be scant protection against the Germans should the Germans elect to follow us with fire. I slipped and fell down the... fell face down in the snow. I cursed my slick overshoes. I rose and fell again. I found myself not caring if the Germans did fire. Snow had gotten inside my shoes and my feet were soaked. My clothes were drenched. Perspiration covered my body and my mouth was dry. I wanted a cigarette. I felt like we were helpless little bugs scurrying blindly about now that some man monster had lifted the log under which we had been hiding. I wondered if it would not be better to be killed, and perhaps that would be an end to everything. And that's the that's the section right there that, like I said, I mean, you just can't, I couldn't skip anything in there. It's just too much stuff going on, and to hear what it's like from his perspective of being overrun, 